Dr. Alice Gottlieb has received numerous awards, including the American Skin Association Psoriasis Research Award, the Honorary Fellowship Award of the American College of Clinical and Pharmacology, National Psoriasis Foundation awarded her as Outstanding Educator, uh, and she is one of the first female scientists that cover, uh, is uh, on the cover of Journal of Investigational Dermatology and as translational research. Dr. Godlieb was on the board of the American Academy of Dermatology 2011 to 2015. She is the founder and president of the Board of International Dermatology Outcomes Measures, active in the autoimmune disease community as a counselor of the International Psoriasis Council and a member of the executive and steering committee of GRAPA. Whew. This is a very busy young lady and very well accomplished. Beyond all her medical degree and awards, the most important thing that I find with Dr. Gottlieb is her passion and care for her patients. Each and every one of her patients literally feel like they're the only one that she cares for. That's how much attention she gives them. So it is my esteemed honor and pleasure to give you Dr. Alice Gottlieb. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. That was very sweet. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about TALS, the generic name is Ixikizumab, it's an anti-IL-17 monoclonal antibody um, and uh, it's uh, not only approved for, uh, uh, FDA approved for adults with moderate to severe psoriasis who are candidates for either phototherapy or systemic therapy but also for adults with active psoriatic arthritis. And, um, uh, what Eileen may or may not have told you, I'm boarded both in rheumatology and dermatology, so it's exciting to me to have drugs that work for both diseases because I'm interested in both and I think both matter. And I'm going to give away the wow, I think the wow slide is not upfront and personal, but the wow slide is that there's not only FDA proof to control signs and symptoms of psoriatic arthritis, but actually inhibit radiographic progression at week 16. And that would be make it the first non-TNF blocker to have that kind of a strong label. So it's exciting to me that we can treat both diseases at once with the same molecule. Okay. I have to tell you this is not a CME program and that I am being paid to do this. Okay. Okay, so this is now we're going to first talk, I'm going to be the dermatologist, so we'll, t we'll talk about the psoriasis first. Psoriasis is, is undertreated in the dermatology community. So to give you an example, um, what percentage of dermatologists use methotrexate? Take a guess, which has been around more longer than many of you have, than you have been around. So take a guess. 25%, 50%, 75%—everybody. Well, it's about 25%, and so it's an undertreated condition and. Uh, there are a variety of reasons for it, which I won't go into here, but in answer to that, the major patient support group, the National Psoriasis Foundation, got together and they um, and published that, that, that what they saw as a goal is that after 12 weeks of treatment, a patient should have less than 1% body, body surface area involvement with psoriasis. So that's a pretty high target uh, to, tar to aim for. But, they, but the impetus for that was to get dermatologists to stop undertreating psoriasis. And so I mentioned that, uh, uh, that uh, TALTS or, or ixekizumab targets interleukin 17A. Its half-life is about 13 to 17, 13 days, which justifies the dosing which you're going to see. And this drug has been around since about 2009 or so in clinical trials, well actually 2008. It was FDA approved for psoriasis in May of 2016 and it was approved at the end of uh, last year in December of 2017 for psoriatic arthritis. So uh, the psoriasis clinical trials I'm going to show you share uh, things in common. It's basically adults with moderate to severe psoriasis um, body surface area for the non-clinicians measures extent of disease. A physician's global uh, measures uh, the quality of lesions, how red, thick, and scaly this plaque type psoriasis is on the day that you see it. Um, three or more indicates um, moderate or greater disease. 
PASI is a composite score that takes into account body surface area involvement and degree of redness, thickness, and scaliness. It goes from zero to 72. You never reach 72. Basically, it kind of ceilings out somewhere, you know, I mean, in a clinical trial, it's typical that the starting ones are in the 20s, that the starting uh, PASI. Okay, um, outcome measure is the uh, percent, it's a co-primary endpoint percentage of patients who achieve a 75% or more drop in that PASI score, and also those patients who uh, uh, get a clearer, almost clear uh, rating on that physician's global assessment. And you can see the secondary endpoints there, uh, PASI 90s, 90% 90 or, uh, or more, 90% uh, improvement, 100%. PASI 100 is 100 percent, which means you don't see anything no matter how you look. Okay. I'll point out that in the clinical trials, roughly a quarter of the patients already had seen another biologic before entering this. 50 percent or so had uh, conventional um, systemic treatment like methotrexate and 44 percent had prior phototherapy. So this was a fairly experienced population of patients. Okay, the basic design of phase three, which is, this, uh, for those who don't know, is the pivotal studies that really determine FDA approval, or not approval but in the case, in this case it's approval. Um, there was uh, 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 three clinical trials. Um, one of them was, uh, well, the dosing of TALS will be the same in all of them. It'll either be, there's a loading dose of two injections or 160 milligrams on the first day, and then, um, TALTS was uh, che checked, was get dosed every two weeks or every four weeks up to week 12 for this purpose. The top study compares only to placebo. The bottom study also has an active comparator and that's um, etanercept. Uh, uh, for those of you, that etanercept is a, uh, a, a TNF um, uh, a blocker that has been FDA approved for a long time for psoriasis and it's dosed 50 milligrams twice weekly. Okay, so I'm going to show you the results. So the, roughly the summary, if, if, if it makes it easier for you to remember, is that the percentage of pa patients achieving PASI 75 is 90 percent roughly, PASI 90, 71 percent, PASI 140 percent, and these are really high numbers and for, uh, uh, and uh, it's really very dramatic, the clinical response. And here are the three studies, the co-primary endpoints across the three studies, percent PASI 75 and also uh, percentage of patients who achieve a physician's global of zero or one at week 12. The green is the TALTS and the gray is the placebo. You can see they're extremely low placebo rates, which is, uh, is, is bad for the patients who are on the placebo for 12 weeks. They're not getting better. If anything, they're getting worse. But it's good for the scientists because it obviously makes for very clean studies and the smaller sample size. But as you can see here, the, how consistent the results are across the um, three studies where there are thousands of patients involved at the end of the day. And so you can see uh, roughly 90% of patients achieve a PASI 75 and pretty close behind if you're looking for a percentage of patients who are clear or almost clear, it's around a low 80s if percent. Yeah, okay. Okay, this is looking at PASI 100 where you're looking at absolutely no psoriasis left and you can see it's uh, roughly around high 30s, 40%. Uh, for TALS, 0 to 1 percent in the placebo. And if you're looking for a, a physician's global of 0, the numbers are almost identical, and you expect it to be, right, if PASI 100 should equal uh, uh, pa uh, PGA of 0, because it means no psoriasis. And the fact that the numbers are so close, I think, says a lot about the validity of the studies, too. Okay, here's a picture, okay. Um, and this is a time course, so, okay, so this is a patient at week zero, week one, week two, week three, by week four achieved PASI 75, and that's at week 12, and you can see the numbers, 19.2 to 2.8. Here's another patient with a lot, you know, a really very, a lot of psoriasis, week two. Week three, 
Week four reached PASI 75. Week 12 PASI, actually 90% improvement. The brown coloration for the non-dermatologist is not active psoriasis. It's post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which is not active disease. It's the, the consequence of having had active disease. And here's a PASI 100. Week one, week two, week three achieved PASI 75, week four beat PASI 90, by week eight achieved PASI 100. So you can imagine how good a patient feels when this happens. Talking about adverse events that happened in 1% or more of TALPS treated patients, the most common one is, is injection site reactions. So Somebody tell me in the audience, is it the drug or is it the vehicle the drug is dissolved in? And tell me why. Yes, science is here. This one should be easy for you. Well, which one? Well, it's, it's something having to do with the drug, right? Because the ejection site reaction is higher in the drug group than the placebo. And if, for those of you who know uh, Umira, it's not that one, the placebo rate was as high injection site reactions as in the Umira group, and that says it's something in the, it's in the diluent. So there, um, these injection site reactions are generally mild. They generally occur early on in treatment, and very, very few patients actually discontinue because of them. But you ha that is something you have to tell a patient about. And, and, um, and you can see with the active controller, Tandercept has you know, also injection site reactions. Um, upper respiratory infections are common in all groups and does not distinguish among the um, three groups. Uh, nausea, I don't know why that was happened in more than 1%, but I think unrelated to the drug. We'll get to tinea infections um, slightly more with the TALTS group, and we'll, we'll talk about Candida in a minute. Okay. Uh, in ter the serious infection rate, which means by, it's an FDA uh, uh, definition of either requiring hospitalization, IV antibiotics, um, and you can see that it's the same among the placebo and the two biologics group, as is the general infection rate. And as you can see here, um, this is the change in uh, PASI over time. You can see that uh, by week one already 30% uh, decrease, week two 52%, week four 70%, week five 85% mean percentage change, and week 12 a mean percentage change of 91%. And the gray in the placebo shows how nice and low the placebo effect. Again, good for the, doc the investigator, bad for the patient to be in the placebo group. Okay. Then you can ask about age, race, gender, body weight, previous treatment with a biologic. Because remember, in clinical practice, it's more likely, at least now, uh, that, that, uh, that TALTS will not be the first biologic a patient sees. So in practice, that's an important thing to do. And, I can, um, and I'm going to show you only some of the data that back that it does not, that there's no difference in response dependent on age, race, gender, body weight or previous treatment with a biologic. But the one I'm going to show you is previous treatment with a biologic. This is uh, the most stringent analysis, NRI analysis. And you can see that the hatched lines are biologic naive, and the dark green are the biologic experience. And you can see whether you look at PASI 75, 90, or 100 response, it's the same. And that's, I, I, as a clinician, that, that's very nice for me because I can tell a patient who's had a previous biologic that the data that I'm, that I'm, that, that it's going to be a similar response even if they didn't ever have a biologic. Okay. Now this is an experiment that the FDA mandates. It, um, they mandate that uh, people who are clear or almost clear get random, re-randomized at, and they get at week 12 to either get drug continuing or placebo. Why do you think that the FDA wants to take people who are doing well and suddenly give them placebo? Well, they want to see how long does the clinical response last in the absence of treatment. They want to also ask, see if there's rebound. And they also want to see as if you can gain response once you've lost it. This is an extremely cruel experiment from patients' point of view, because you clear a patient, and I've done a lot of these, you clear a patient and then they go back to what they were, and they are very unhappy. And so, but the FDA mandates it. Now, the, the, there were two dosing schedules that were done here. 
Maintenance dose touts every 12 weeks, bad idea. Um, touts every four weeks, good idea. And so if when, these, when any of the patients in these groups relapse, which was defined as getting that physician's global of moderate or more, three or more, they were treated with uh, touts, uh, a single injection, 80 milligrams every four weeks. And when you do that, uh, patients who were clear, almost clear at week 12, uh, on 80 milligrams TALTS every two weeks were re-randomized uh, uh, and received either TALTS every four weeks uh, or they received a placebo. And you can see that at week 60, which is about a year, 75% of patients still had that physician's global of 0, 1. But the placebo, by 60, it's down to 7% having that. It's not a good idea to stop the drug. Okay. And I compare it to, you know, I take a Lipitor for my high cholesterol. If I stop the Lipitor, my cholesterol is going to go back up to 300. Or a diabetic who is taking insulin, you don't stop it when the sugar is under control. The same thing. We're, we're not curing disease, but we're controlling it. If you look over, now that's 156 weeks. If you look over 156 weeks, and I'm just looking at those patients who were uh, do dosed with TALTS, and receiving maintenance dosing every four weeks. Whether you do a modified NRI, which is shown here with the squares, let's see if I can, or whether you do an as observed, I'll explain the difference. You can see that the response is consistent over three years, which is very good because what patients really hate is the roller coaster. They truly hate, you know, better, not better, you know, they, they really dislike that. And so what is modified NRI? Modified NRI is that if a patient stops the drug because it didn't work or a side effect, they're counted as a non-responder. If they stop the drug because they moved to another state or whatever reason, they didn't like the doctor, or anything not related to safety or efficacy, some calculation is based on performance up to date and then is carried forward. As observed means you take only the patients who were left in the study. As observed is the is the least stringent because you're selecting out for the best responders and the least side effects. So and modified NRI is more stringent and even in that setting it's doing consistently well. Now if you raise the bar and look at PASI 90, same thing, okay? Um, it's consistent over time. If you look at PASI 100, same thing, no matter how you analyze it, it's consistent over time and you're talking three years. It's a long time for a clinical study. Now back to safety at a year. Now remember, you don't have a, place, uh, a placebo for the whole year, but uh, and so, but you can see here that the serious infection rate is no different, the infection no different, serious adverse events, which is an FDA de uh, definition, which we can go into later if you're interested, no difference, uh, and, and so that's all very good. Anyway, now let's talk about particular events of interest. So for those, so anybody know what Job syndrome is? Job syndrome they, is a genetic disorder where they get, they have an absence of STAT, or dysfunctional STAT3, which is the intracellular messenger for the TH17 T cell. And what they get is disseminated mucocutaneous candidiasis. So it's, now we're not making a Job syndrome when we treat with anti-IL-17. But it's not surprising that you see a, a, a small increase in yeast infections and candida infections. And so these are not serious ones. They don't get disseminated the candidiasis. They, for the ladies, it's in the private area. There may be some oral candidiasis. It's treated topically, but that's the infection. It's not TB that you have to warn so much. It's really candida. Uh, we don't know the reason why, and I'm not sure, and it's not even really particularly clear among authorities that this is a big problem. But there have been flares of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, in the whole class of, anti, of IL-17 inhibitors. So definitely would use a lot of caution if somebody has both inflammatory bowel disease and psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. You could see that in this particular study there were none, but uh, no Crohn's and there's a little bit of uh, very small ulcerative colitis. Malignancies, you can see that it's over the uh, six years, it's low. Um, um, what else? Mace events, nothing unusual. Some, there are some allergic reactions. That it's a protein, you always have to uh, think about that. 
injection site reactions uh, do occur, but if you look at the time course, which I'm not showing you, it decreases over time. Now, I told you there was a comparator against a, a Tanicept or Embro, and you can see that green is the TALTS, and whether you look at PASI 75, 90, 100, SP, a PGA of 0, 1, or a PGA of 0, TALTS beats Embro every time. And the thing I think that's good about this is that you can see, let's say for PASI 75, Embrel in the gray is 41%. Well, I'm, I'm the senior author on the New England Journal paper of Embrel, and the number was around 45% in a study done by the sponsor of, uh, of Embrel. So what I, I like, what I like is how consistent the results are across clinical trials, no matter whether it's run by the competitor or the originator. And I think from a scientific point of view that makes the methodology, gives me a lot of strength that we're measuring something real. And so, but obviously, uh, let's face it, uh, Taltz beats Embro by a lot. <laughs> anyway, here's uh, I think a, a wild slide for the dermatologist. Um, Eustachinumab target, it, it's FDA approved for psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, um, and it, in, uh, it blocks the P40 chain, which is a common chain for interleukin-12 and interleukin-23. And, it's, uh, and so this was a comparator study of basically TALTS versus eustachinumab. And TALTS is in the green and you can eustachinumab, I don't know what color that is, but black or dark blue. And you can see ditto. I mean, basically um, TALTS beats eustachinumab at, um, whether you're measuring a uh, percentage of PASI 90 responders or the pa percentage of PASI 100 responders. So you can see that, and that's a wow slide because um, to can you remember is a popular drug and has, and has felt to have a high degree of efficacy, but TALT beats it. Okay, I'm toting my derm hat here, and now I'm the rheumatologist, and I'm going to present psoriatic arthritis. Okay. And here's to the dermatology community. I mean, in my impression, as a dermatologist, dermatologists don't ask enough about psoriatic arthritis. Um, and, and we, you know, at the AAD, there's a guideline session on psoriasis, and you have dedicated doctors who are coming to listen to about psoriasis. We ask them, what percentage of you ask about psoriatic arthritis? Guess. I'll tell you, it's about 30%, even in people interested in, in psoriasis. If you ask them six months after we educate them, how many of you ask about psoriatic arthritis? 29%. We did, really did a great job. We really did. I mean, it's really fairly pathetic. So um, now, rheumatologists, on the other hand, they ask obviously about psoriatic arthritis, but what they don't distinguish is the skin. They don't, they don't distinguish which drugs work better on the skin. And so, for instance, they view all the TNF blockers similarly. And that's maybe true for the joints, but it's not true for the skin. And when you do studies in psoriatic arthritis patients, their health-related quality of life is optimal only when you improve both the skin and the joints. Uh, it's not just the joints. So there's education needed in different ways in both specialties. And psoriatic arthritis is the major comorbidity of psoriasis. It occurs in roughly 25 to 30 percent of patients with moderate to severe psoriasis. It occurs roughly 10 to 12 years. At, in 84% of patients, it occurs, the joint uh, pathology or signs and symptoms occurs 10 to 12 years after the skin. So we do have a warning sign of who's at risk for psoriatic arthritis. It's a patient with psoriasis. So it really is the dermatologist who's the first, certainly the first specialist who can actually detect psoriatic arthritis. And why does it matter? Because psoriatic arthritis can be disabling. Delay in diagnosis and treatment does lead to more disability. And we now have you know, four TNF blockers. We have one IL-17 inhibitor at TALTS, and there will be others that inhibit prog radiographic progression. So by intervening early, you can actually alter the, uh, the natural history of the disease and prevent disability, which is a very powerful thing to say. And so um, we've made progress in this area, but I think on both sides of the specialty, we need more crosstalk and, and more emphasis on this ma the major comorbidity of psoriasis. And so, uh, is psoriatic arthritis, and I try to educate the rooms that the major comorbidity of psoriatic arthritis is the skin disease. 
this is what you want to prevent. You don't have to learn how to read x-rays. And it may be hard for you to see. Focus on the thumbs. It looks kind of like you have a pencil point in a cup. And that pencil and cup deformity is typical of psoriatic arthritis. And uh, it's caused by basic uh, proliferative and erosive changes in the joint. You can also see here uh, proliferative changes and uh, erosive changes. And that is the x-ray hallmark of psoriatic arthritis that you can see in the same unit, both proliferative and erosive changes. I, I won't go into it more here for this audience. I, I don't think that that's the particular interest. Um, okay, so here are the psoriatic arthritis trials. So these are uh, the, uh, the uh, patients who had to have, well, they had to have three or more tender swollen joints. Uh, they were uh, either got uh, after a loading dose tolts every two or every four weeks. Spirit one is biologic naive. And that's the study where they did the x-ray studies to look at inhibition of radiographic progression. These patients, um, well, we'll get, they had one difference from Spirit, Spirit 2, which is the TNF blocker exposed population. These patients had at least one or two uh, previous TNF blockers. They both share the same primary, primary endpoint, which is signs and symptoms control at week 24, which is measured by 20% improvement in this composite ACR score. But it's a signs and symptoms score. Spirit one is the one, the, the biologic naive, one, the one where they're looking at inhibition of radiographic progression. I told you the basic entry criteria, but in order to select out for patients who are going to progress, because to look for x-ray changes in half a year is asking for a lot. So they either had to have already had an erosion on an x-ray or they had to have a high CRP, which indicated a high inflammatory burden. Now this had an active control. And the active control was adalimumab uh, at the psoriatic arthritis dose, which is 40 milligrams every two weeks, no loading dose. And at the time this was done, I think it was a very gutsy and clever experiment to do, to have an active control. Now we take it for granted, but this was started years ago. Okay. In Spirit 1, there was roughly 50% of patients already were, were using methotrexate already. Um, this is Spirit 2. This does not have the active control in it. It's just two doses of TALTS versus placebo. Now, recognize that in a psoriatic arthritis study, it's rarely, a, it's not a true placebo study because you're allowed to have stable doses of methotrexate, stable low doses of systemic corticosteroids, almost everybody was on a stable dose of non-steroidal. So it's not like a psoriasis study, where it really is a placebo. They're getting nothing in a psoriasis study. I want to point that out. And these folks have had to have had prior treatment with at least one conventional disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug like a methotrexate in order to get in. And in this biologic experience population, only about a third of patients were on currently getting methotrexate. And roughly, it's 60% had one TNF blocker and 30% or 35% or had two TNF blockers. Okay. So here are the results. This is um, improvement in the signs and symptoms control at week 24 in the biologic naive patients, the SPIRIT-1 study. And just like uh, it's 58% of patients achieved that ACR20 at week 24 versus a placebo effect of 30%. If you look on the right at the lavender colored numbers, this is the active control adalimumab, which had 50% of patients achieving ACR20 at week 24. And, and uh, similarly, and so you can, you can make your own conclusions, but personally, I think those numbers look similar, okay? And in this population of psoriatic arthritis patients, you can look at skin response. And my son always says, if you want a dog, don't get a cat. And in this case, if you want to study psoriasis, it is not, don't study it in a psoriatic arthritis population because PASI scores are not very well responsive to change at low body surface areas. And in psoriatic arthritis studies done in rheumatology practices, the PASI and body surface area involvements are low. And so, but you see excellent clinical responses in the skin, but they're not going to be as high as when you do a pure psoriasis study, and that's a technical aspect of the PASI score. So if you want a dog, don't get a cat. Okay. 
All right, and this is the uh, Signs and Symptoms Controlled by Treatment Week. You can see that um, it's interesting that in the biologic naive, naive population, 57% have ACR 20 at week 12, but the primary endpoint is 12 weeks later, and it's 58%. That's good. Um, if you're looking at the TNF experience, it's 50% um, versus 57% in the biologic naive. So there's a little bit of hit for getting, uh, having it a previous biologic, but there isn't a big hit for it. You can still say that roughly half the patients will achieve signs and symptoms control at the primary endpoint. Frankly, they're, CV, uh, they're actually achieving it earlier at half the time. Okay, here we go again to modified NRI in the squares versus observed in the circles. And this is a signs and symptoms control through week 108. It's a consistent response in TELS dosed patients. And if you look, raise the bar and ask for 50% improvement signs and symptoms, it's consistent over week 108, whether you measure NRI or modified NRI or as observed. Now, if you're looking at ACR 70, which some folks consider remission, um, you can see the same thing. So consistent response over time, both for the joints and the skin. And here, the safety uh, adverse events in the psoriatic arthritis population, there's nothing really uh, significantly different from the skin population that stands out. I'm going to hold it for a few minutes. And to summarize, in terms of that, there was a, in the psoriatic arthritis population, there was a slight, slightly higher in, incidence of flu and conjunctivitis. But it's really pretty consistent with what we see in psoriasis, nor is that surprising. And again, this is for the psoriatic arthritis population. In this case, uh, there were no Crohn's cases, no MACE cases. There was, again, TALS versus placebo, about 1.3% 1, 1 of candida infections. We talked about that. Um, depression, there was no increased uh, depression at all, and, and that's relevant for those of you who are clinicians because there's another IL-17 blocker that has a depression warning. This one does not. Um, allergic reactions, hypersensitivity. Um, uh, you can see here there's obviously a little bit more in TALTS versus the placebo. Interesting that 1.8% of the population has an allergic reaction to a placebo, but okay. okay. Malignancies weren't an issue either. So that's the week 24. On the right is week, to your right, yeah, right is week 20, so 52. That doesn't have a placebo, but you can see it's not, there are no cumulative side effects, which is good. Now, it's very common, especially with TNF blockers, and, and that, you, that you're taught as a rheumatologist you have to dose a biologic with methotrexate. And, uh, and, method, and doing that is not risk-free for the patient. Methotrexate has lots of side effects, and so um, it's, you'd like to know whether you really have to do it anyway. And so, um, this is, so they, they looked at their study population. Now, you notice if you're looking at the numbers of patients, they're much smaller in a psoriatic arthritis and a psoriasis study. So admittedly, you don't have huge numbers of patients in each cohort. But if you compare the TALTS versus placebo uh, response, the percentage of patients achieving signs and symptoms control, ACR20, at week 24, you can see it, may, it really, uh, with concomitant methotrexate, certainly didn't make it higher. It was a little bit lower, in fact, but it certainly didn't increase the response. So in practice, what this means is you do not have to use this with methotrexate. This can be used as, as single therapy, okay, which is good. I mean, and from both the patient point of view and the doctor point of view, it's, and it, it's, it's good anyway. This is the wow slide, okay. Notice it's near the end when people are already thinking, what are we doing next? But anyway, here it is. Okay, it's one thing to, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to minimize that controlling pain and signs and, and, and swelling is, is that, uh, that's, that's trivial. It is important. But inhibition of progression of disease is really important. And this is the wow slide. And this is the x-ray study and looking at structural joint damage. And how they measure this, this is not measured by the derma room doing the study. There's independent radiologists who are looking blinded at x-rays. And they, they basically, it's called a modified sharp score. 
they're basically me measuring how joint space narrowed and eroded all a lot of joints are. They, they look at many joints, many, many joints. And then they add up the numbers. And big numbers are bad and little numbers are good. <clears throat> and that, <coughs> excuse me, one second. As you can see, the placebo in gray, the numbers, whether you look, uh, whether you look at the total score, the modified uh, sharp score, or you look at the components, joint space narrowing, bone erosion score, placebo is, number is visibly and also significantly larger than the TALTS. And so you want to have small numbers because you want to have less progression. So this is the, these are the data that got the label of inhibition of radiographic progression at week 16. That's only four months and you're already showing a difference in x-rays. And that's, that's a wow slide. I mean, and so, and that, so you have a, a, a drug that responds really well in the skin where you basically have 90% PASI 75 and you're actually not only controlling signs and symptoms, but you're actually um, inhibiting progression of disease. For me, that's the wow slide, big, big wow slide. Okay, uh, some of the uh, other manifestations of psoriatic arthritis, dactylitis. Um, dactylitis means swollen fingers and toes. It's due to inflammation not only of the joints, but all the soft tissues around the joints. And you can see that um, there are improvements in the green talts. In, this is um, percentage of patients who, are, who had dactylitis, whose dactylitis resolved um, uh, at week 24, and you can see that TALT beats placebo. Okay. Another manifestation of psoriatic arthritis is called enthesitis. It's inflammation at the ligamentous and tendinous insertions into joints. And you can see that uh, here the results, I think, are, are um, less dramatic, but you can see that they had enthesitis to begin with. That, uh, a, that a numerically um, in, uh, higher number of patients with um, TALTS achieve resolution of their enthesitis. Give you examples of enthesitis for people who don't know what it is. It's, it's like tennis elbow when you haven't played tennis. Um, uh, Achilles tendonitis, that's the Achilles is here, the heel, and, uh, and the resolution of that. That's a, those are typical sites of enthesitis. Uh, sticky rib pains, because you have NCCs all over the place here. Okay. And there is a, a physical function um, instrument called the HACDI, which is a patient reported outcome measure and a, a change in 0.35 downward or more is considered clinically meaningful. And you can see that, that here, here that TALTS does achieve that at week 16, even earlier than the primary endpoint. And you can see that, um, you, you see it both in biologic naive on the left and in TNF experience, spirit one versus spirit two trial. Okay, so who shouldn't have this drug? If you've been allergic to it, don't give it again. Okay, that's, that's true with anything, any drug, anything. I mean, it's kind of like, duh, anyway, but don't. Okay. Um, uh, if somebody, again, here's another duh, if somebody has a serious infection, why would you give any immunosuppressant in that setting? It's not unique to TALTS. And so if somebody has an active serious infection, don't start the TALTS. You probably should stop the TALTS and, have them, and make sure that that infection gets uh, taken care of. That's a no-brainer too, okay? So that's not just true for TALTS, it's any immunosuppressant whether it's prednisone, whether it's methotrexate, you name it, and Premalas, a TNF blocker, that, that you know, um, cell set, it's just common sense. Okay. You are supposed to screen for tuberculosis, and uh, notice it doesn't say you have to do it every year, but in my clinical practice I do. I have a population of, uh, in one of my practices, which consists mostly of illegal immigrants from Latin America, my incidence of, of you know, TB is about, of latent TB is 25% before they start anything. So that's definite, I mean, I think it's, you know, use your judgment, but I, if it was, for me, if it's worth screening before they treat, I think I should still be following it while they're on treatment. It's not a big deal. Um, but TB is, uh, it's, I, I, in my experience, it's, a, it's less of a problem with these newer biologics than with the TNF blockers. Hypersensitivity, we talked about that. Uh, and I, in my practice, when I give 
when we have the first, um, I do this with all the biologics, but also with ixikizumab, I have them sit a while. I want to make sure they don't, aren't allergic. And so but that's not, un not unique to this drug, but that's what I do. I told you about inflammatory bowel disease. Um, there's this warning there. It's a very low percentage. We don't know whether these people had it before and it was brought out or whether, but whatever it is, if somebody has inflammatory bowel disease, I would use IL-17 blockers in general with a lot of caution, if at all. I mean, uh, immunizations like any immunosuppressant, don't give live vaccines, okay? Don't, just don't. The answer is no. Anyway. Um, uh, so, and we talked about the adverse reactions already. Colds are common in um, nausea. I don't think it's related to the drug, and tinea infections. And I talked to you, you know, about uh, candida infections. I don't know whether some of these tinea are being are candida infections that are being coded as tinea. I don't know that one way or another, but I wonder about that. Okay. Now, how did the dosing is different? Okay. The dosing for skin, for psoriasis, is that loading dose on the first day and then for every two weeks for the first 12 weeks and then every four weeks. But in, for, oh, oh, well, I don't think we have a lot of clinicians here, but you really are supposed to take the syringe out and let it sit at room temperature for a half an hour before you dose it. I don't think patients always do it, but anyway, but you are supposed to. Um, okay. Now, wait a minute. This is the psoriatic arthritis dosing. It's, two, it's that same loading dose, but not that uh, every two weeks for first 12 weeks. It's every four weeks. Um, if they have moderate to severe skin disease, you are allowed to go use the psoriasis dosing, which I happen to like a lot <laughs> anyway. Um, I bet the numbers have increased since the launch in March of 2016, but there have been over 20,000 patients on it. I'm going to, there are people from Lilly, if somebody is interested, um, it's not, I think Taltz led the way with this. Uh, they were the first and everybody copied them. But if patients have commercial insurance, they're almost giving the drug away. I mean, at least for the next few years, they can get this drug, okay? If they have Medicare and Medicaid, they cannot. Anyway, that's, uh, but I'm not going to go into this. Um, there are people here from Lilly if you want to talk about that. So in summary, um, basically, nine, in, for the skin, derm hat on, 90% PASI, 75, 70%, well, it's 71% PASI, 90, 40% PASI, 100, 83% Physicians Global of 0 or 1. In terms of the joints, 58% uh, uh, ACR20 signs and symptoms control, um, uh, and uh, and, and if they've had a previous, biolog a previous biologics TNF blockers, that goes to 53%. And that's it. I'm finished. So now you can ask me any, any question you want. <laughs> anyway, so thank you. Okay. Just like medical school, most of the people sitting in the back. They used to be doing crossword puzzles in my day, but now they're there on their cell phones. <laughs> texting. No questions? Okay. Well, then right, I, I oh, do. We Sorry. have a question there. Yeah, it's really far away. Hey, Alice, this is Thomas Holt speaking. Um, thank you for the very nice presentation. Very good overview. I have a question as to the rationale for selecting the dose for the maintenance treatment. Why do we choose? Full week and 12 week, nothing in between, or changing the dose, but not the dosing interval? Well, I think, well, you're in drug development, so I think you can answer that question. We would definitely, from a clinician point of view, what I would like to see is dose flexibility. I'd like to see the ability to dose up more than dose down. I mean, and so. But as you know, if you, want, if you want to get that in the label, you have to get that in a controlled, with a placebo controlled situation, if you want to get that in the label. And I have people, and, and that's what I'm told is by every company, including some of the ones you've worked for, I mean, I've been told by every company that's why they don't do it. Okay, it, it has to do that it makes the study very big, expensive, 
And, and yes, we do, do we need this? Yeah, we absolutely do in practice. And because if you want to up the up dose, and it's not in the label, the payer's not going to give it to you because it's expensive. But the reason I'm told has to do with that it makes the studies larger and more expensive and you need to placebo control it. And that's what I've been told why by regulatory and almost every company that I've asked for it, why I can't have it. Yes, ma'am. Can we can get you a microphone? Can someone can you or can, yeah. are you able to walk? Yeah, then you can go. There's a microphone here. Delightful. Delightful talk. Um, Thank you. Carlos Carizian from uh, University of South Carolina. Um, I was wondering, have you looked into anti antibody against the drug? And have you seen any? Because I looked your, at your adverse side effects, and I don't think you have seen you looking into, into this. I'm glad you asked. Hey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, we don't know each other, that's my disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so this is neutralizing antibodies, okay? And it's 2% in the, uh, by week, uh, uh, let's see, by week 60, 2% in the psoriasis population and in the psoriatic arthritis percent is 8%. And if you're going to add, I asked already people at the company, why is it higher in psoriatic arthritis than so in psoriasis? So I don't have to ask the question to you. <laughs> I asked about the, the psoriatic arthritis because it was a little bit surprising because you would expect that with all that methotrexate and other stuff yes. and the prednisone on board, they'd make less. Yes. But anyway, and, but I don't know the answer, but I don't think, you know, I think people are, are, are interested in studying this, but these are the numbers. And 2% um, over, over a year is, for the psoriasis is really quite low and, and the consistency of response is definitely an improvement over what we've had in the past. Not to say that, you know, I mean, I, I think that many of the biologics are terrific drugs and they've, you know, and I introduced TNF blockers into, into psoriasis, so, but, um, but I think this is an improvement over what we've seen in the, in the past. So that's the answer, but I don't have an answer why PSA is higher than psoriasis. I don't. Uh, actually, is there any, do people want to hazard, anybody want to hazard an opinion why it's higher? No? Okay. So, Thank so you. Need study. Oh, Jay, Clem, Jay Clemmy, um, clinician, Northeast Ohio. Do you have a surveillance regimen beyond history for ongoing patients for emergence of uh, joint problems in a patient who seems to have just skin psoriasis. Okay, I'm glad you asked that question too, because um, you know that the post-marketing phase four commitment for safety is a requirement, and Lily has joined the Corona database, which is a disease registry. It's not just a single drug registry, and myself and Joe Marola applied for a, um, for a PS, a psoriatic arthritis patient questionnaire called the PSED-12 to be put into corona now as part of every psoriasis patient getting it. And we won that one. We got, there were two NPF slots for a derm related research project and we applied for that. And I think it's really important because Derms basically, including those in the corona registry, it'll be about 30% of patients who probably get asked about their psoriatic arthritis symptoms. So to have a psoriatic arthritis symptoms questionnaire means we'll be, and they also administer the PEST. The PEST is a psoriasis diagnosis pay, uh, pay questionnaire. And between the two of them, we will get an idea of, of the psoriatic arthritis in the psoriasis population, and we'll get an idea whether the treatments they're on actually, even though they're getting treated for a derm problem, 
as actually affecting the psoriatic arthritis. Now, if you're asking me about how do we have a way of maybe proving that if we treat psoriasis early on, we prevent psoriatic arthritis, I've been trying to get that done for 20 years. And ever since Shearing owned Infliximab, and I was told by Shearing at that time that it was a dumb idea, but I don't think it was a dumb idea. If we actually looked at that from the beginning in a rigorous way, we'd have an answer already by now. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Sir, I can't, I can't see very well from back here. Okay. So, Sir. <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh. great lecture. I'm from Japan, and my Dr. Hayashi, uh, in, in Japan, as a dermatologist, I have some question about the side effect. I'm sorry, there is time, time lag. So, uh, we recently experienced uh, side, possibly induced by IL-17 biologics of uh, interstitial pneumonia, and uh, recently some paper is also published about the possible, possibly induced. Uh, Interstitial pneumonia by IL 17A biologics. Interstitial so pneumonia? Uh, yeah, interstitial pneumonia. So, do you have any data or like experience? So far, the data um, that isn't a problem with, with in, in the populations that are, that are in these study populations. There's now studies that are, there's up to six years, I think, at least experience in clinical trials. And you're not seeing that. It's not like methotrexate causing interstitial pneumonia in RA patients. There may be a paper, and maybe it's true or not, but it, it wasn't seen in these studies. Yeah. Well, but, you know, the, we have the corona registry. So far as I'm aware, it's not seen in that either. Anyway, but we'll, you know, that's what you have a registry for. But so far, uh, ha uh, not reported today. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I'm sure it's a real side effect, but yeah, I guess. Thanks yeah, I'm so not much. saying it isn't a real side of it, but just if you ask, have we seen it in these data? No. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, this is Jeff Travers from uh, Wright State. And uh, first of all, that was a very nice talk. Thank you. Maybe stand back, because maybe it's, uh, I'm hearing a lot of reverberations. So my question has to do with the uh, painful injection. Mm -hmm. And with your experience, uh, do you have any su suggestions in terms of treatment? And also, do, do we have an idea of the mechanism? OK. Remind me of the second question if I've forgotten it by the time I okay. answered the first one. So what to do about them? Um, First of all, in my, in my experience, and I've done the clinical trials and I've also done, I also use the, the drug. Um, my experience is my incidence is far lower than the tw whatever, 20, 17, 21% or whatever is there. In my practice, it's, it's quite a bit lower. It generally is mild and it's generally early on and it doesn't persist throughout. However, there are patients who, who, who do have it. I'm not denying that. And so one of the things actually that some of my colleagues have suggested to me is that if you use the pre-filled syringe rather than the auto-injector, you see less of it. So maybe, maybe the rate has something to do with it and if a patient can, I don't know, I, 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 I'm going to start trying that in the few patients who've had that. So you might want to try that. Um, probably, it's probably not a great idea to inject it cold into the, in the patient. I mean, well, let's face it, I think many of our patients take it out of the fridge and go, and you know, go anyway. And so, um, and I have to admit my, um, I'll give you an example, which I was appalled. I mean, um, my mother's quite ill. She was getting uh, embryo and then the visiting nurse came and didn't take it out of, she just took it out of the fridge and just, and I said, no, you're supposed to wait a half hour. She didn't listen, she just jammed it into my mother. I was appalled anyway, and so that, that's a nurse doing it. So people don't always follow the instructions. A nurse didn't get away with it. I didn't they have some comment about that. Anyway, and then, um, and then the mechanism. Unfortunately, I wish I had an answer to that. And, um, it's not that I haven't been torturing the, the appropriate people for it. We really do need to buy, not, not just, the, not the redness. If somebody gets an indurated plaque, something, have you, have you seen that in some of your patients or, that you ask? I have not, but some people say you see it. Those need to be biopsied. You need to know what's going on. We have an accessible tissue and I'm, 
I think they're planning to do it, but they haven't done it yet, so I can't tell you um, what the mechanism of the reaction is. Hi, hey, uh, Arun Khan in Abhi. Uh, nice talk. Great question. You mentioned conjunctivitis. Uh, is that a serious issue? Uh, do you no. have any comments on is it mechanism related, do you think? I, I don't know. Basically, the, uh, the answer is no, it's not a serious issue. And uh, basically, I think it's, it, it's so much of a not a serious issue that it's, um, it, it's not been basically followed up on it, resolved on its own. It's not like the issue with Dupixent, okay, where that has an issue. By the Thank way, you. they don't know the mechanism of theirs either. <laughs> Are there any, for any other questions? Okay, well enjoy your day and have a, and thank you for coming and spending breakfast with me. Thank you.